Born and raised in the UK, Dr. Fran Bagenal is a research scientist and professor at the University of Colorado, Boulder, and is co-investigator and team leader of the Plasma Investigations on NASA's New Horizons mission to Pluto and the Juno mission to Jupiter. She has participated in several of NASA's planetary exploration missions, including Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo, Deep Space 1, New Horizons and Juno. She's also contributed generously to the Caroline Herschel Prize Lecture, which we hold every year in November. Let me hand you over to Fran Bagenal. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be with you today, unfortunately via Zoom, not in person, but I look forward to uh, telling you all about what Juno is finding at Jupiter. So the spacecraft has been orbiting Jupiter since the 4th of July, 2016, and I'm gonna <coughs> give you what we've been learning. So uh, first of all, let's think about Jupiter largest planet in our solar system. It's about 11 times the size of the Earth in radius and diameter, uh, but the mass is about 318 times the mass of the Earth. So this is a really big planet. And if we take the uh, map it out and show you latitude, longitude map, just like we have for Earth, you can see that there is uh, these stripes and these are all clouds. What you're looking at are clouds and you're seeing uh, east and west belts. If I let you see the movie that was taken by the Cassini spacecraft on its way to um, Saturn, you can see this movie of the belts and zones, the east and west winds, very much like the belts and zones on Earth, you can see in the movie above. The big difference though, is that at Earth, there are continents which disrupt, disrupt the flow, whereas on Jupiter, there are no continents. It's just gas and liquid. Uh, and you'll see there are more of these belts and zones at Jupiter because it's spinning faster. It spins every 10 hours, not 24 hours like the Earth. And um, there's a lot more energy involved in the uh, convection in this atmosphere. So what are we really looking at? Well, what we're looking at is a layer of clouds. And uh, it turns out the cloud deck is actually very similar to the pressure that we breathe here at the Earth's surface. And we have three layers of clouds uh, above. We have a top layer is ammonia, it's ammonia ice. And then we have uh, ammonia mixed with sulfur, ammonia hydrosulfide. And then we have water clouds deeper down. So this is the general textbook picture of what we're looking at. So we're seeing most of the gas is in fact hydrogen and helium, but these clouds are really what we see when we look down on the planet. And why do the, are they colored? Because ammonia is in fact normally white. Well, what we're seeing is a small amount of material that colors the clouds. And uh, this is material that comes from below and it's some mixture of, uh, of, of carbon and hydrogen and sulfur and hydrogen and ammonia. And we don't really know exactly what the color material is. So this was the picture that we thought we were going to see when we sent a spacecraft to go into the planet Jupiter to measure its composition. We expected to see three layers of clouds, but what we actually saw was very little clouds. And we wondered what's going on. Well, it turns out that we sent our probe, the only time we've sent a probe, and we happened to land. It was not a, um, a, a directed probe. We just sort of threw it out of the spacecraft, uh, the Galileo spacecraft, into the atmosphere. And it happened to go into that dark area on the left, which turns out to be a hot region. We measure with the infrared telescopes from the Earth. We saw that it was a hot spot. And so it looks like what we were, where we sent the probe was an unusual of the whole of the planet. We happened to go into an area that was particularly dry and particularly hot uh, between the clouds. So this was disappointing because what we really wanted to do is to measure the composition of the atmosphere. And so um, 
the composition is pretty easy to think about for these gas giants. Most of the uh, planet is hydrogen with a bit of helium. So this is the astronomer's sort of periodic table. We just stick with the simplest, most abundant things first. And then after hydrogen and helium is oxygen, third most abundant element in the universe. And you add oxygen to hydrogen, you get water. So we expect there to be a lot of water around uh, in our solar system. And so when we went to Jupiter and sent the probe in, we got the Galileo probe in and we found so little water, um, it made us wonder what's going on. If we look at all of the other elements, so the these um, noble gases, argon, krypton, xenon, as well as carbon and nitrogen and sulfur, they're all enriched relative to the sun by about a factor of two and a half to three. But the oxygen was very low, very little water. And so this was a big puzzle. What was going on? So our ideas of how the solar system forms is that you have a, a sun that is cooling off and it starts off really hot close to the sun and then cools away. And um, the inner region of the solar system, uh, the rocks and the metals condense first, and that makes the inner planets um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars uh, in closer where those materials can condense out. Then further beyond the frost line, ices can begin to condense, and particularly water ice, and oxygen again being the most abundant, third most abundant element in the universe. So we then expect to have that the gas giant planets, the outer solar system, are formed by having an ice core that then captures um, the hydrogen gas on the outside. In the case of Jupiter, we were thinking an ice core that would be on the order of 20 Earth masses, 15, 20 Earth masses. So that's a really big amount of material and yes, makes the big gas giant planet. So this is the theory of how we think the gas giants form, including particularly Jupiter. And um, the goal of this mission Juno is to go and work out where is the water and how do the gas giants form? Let's test and, under, and, and work on our understanding of the structure of Jupiter and what does that tell us about how the solar system formed. Uh, and since we happen to be flying over the poles, let's also look at how the aurora work. So I'll be showing you how this happens. So this is the spacecraft diagram here, and you can see how big it is because there's a little a human down here uh, by the solar panels to give you scale. And you can see these solar panels are used to drive uh, power about 500 watts. Uh, it, the whole spacecraft spins twice uh, a minute. And um, you, it, we've got various uh, pieces of instruments on the spacecraft. So um, we will do gravity science with the antenna. The thing in the middle is the antenna that will communicate with Earth. I'll show you how we do gravity science with the antenna that communicates radio signals Oops, to the Earth. Let me go back. We also have a magnetometer on the end of one of the booms. We have energetic particle measurements, Jade and Jedi, great names. Uh, we have a waves instrument. We have some spectrometers. We measure microwaves. I'll show you how that works too. Uh, infrared spectrometer, a UV spectrometer. And then we just added a little camera to do some public relations. Um, now, the problem with Jupiter is if we want to get close to Jupiter, we've got to be careful because Jupiter has these really nasty radiation belts. So these are the magnetic field traps, very energetic electrons, MeV electrons, that will destroy um, any electronics that go right through the middle of it. Right. And humans would not survive more than, you know, you'd be lucky if it would, you'd last an hour under those environments. It would be really nasty environment. So we've got to avoid this and it's wiggling about because the magnetic field of Jupiter is tilted by about 10 degrees uh, relative to the spin axis. So we've known this for a long time, observed the radio emissions since the 60s. So what we plan to do with Juno is to fly over the poles, duck underneath the radiation belts and skim over the clouds. 
And so we go really fast from pole to pole in, in two hours. And then we spend a long part of the orbit and actually 53 days rest of the orbit and then come back again. And um, we originally planned on about 30 orbits that would um, keep us out of the radiation belts. Okay, so that was the plan. So what we're going to do is we fly over the poles, we're going to measure the magnetic field, the radio waves, the plasma waves, we're going to see the particles bombarding into the atmosphere to cause the aurora, we're going to measure all these things as we fly over the poles, and then we hope to measure what it's like inside. We're going to map out um, the magnetic field and the gravity and the clouds and so on, the weather, um, by spacing out these orbits and then cover uh, the whole planet. Now, I was allowed to go watch the spacecraft being built. It was built south of Denver here, about 40 miles away. Here I am all dressed up in one of these bunny suits. You have to dress up so that you don't touch things and oil from your skin goes onto the spacecraft, has to be kept super, super clean. And here is the spacecraft being built. It took about 18 months to build, put all the pieces together, uh, then put on the solar panels. The solar panels fold up for launch um, and um, then we get it all ready and put it on the top of a, a big rocket. Here it is in Cape Canaveral, um, getting ready for launch in August of 2011. And then of course the team takes a selfie and uh, I'm in there somewhere in the middle and uh, then off it goes. And we had a great successful launch. And on the right, you can see the trajectory that the spacecraft took. Um, we didn't have quite enough umph to get all the way out to Jupiter. So we came back, we got a gravity assist at Earth, flew past the Earth. And this actually let us test out some of our instruments and that gave us enough momentum to get out to Jupiter and um, get ready for orbit insertion. Um, so it says here it was on 7 uh, July 5th, 2016, but in California it was July 4th with a lot of celebrations and fireworks. So I want to tell you a bit though about, uh, these are the orbits that we had. On approach, we made a very special movie and I want to show you that movie um, of what we took in the days and weeks just before we arrived. So uh, humans have been looking at the sky uh, since the beginning, since they crawled out of the cave, if you like, and they noticed that there were patterns in the sky and there were some things, Jupiter in particular, there were a few of these things that wandered relative to the stars. The wandering things were the planets. And indeed, uh, Galileo, um, used the recently invented telescope to look through his telescope and see what was going on around Jupiter. And what he saw were what he first thought were stars, we now know are moons that were orbiting Jupiter. And this was important, it changed our view. Uh, this was proved that not everything orbits the Earth because there was this idea that everything orbited the Earth, the geocentric system, big battle between that idea and other forms of, of uh, cosmology. And here was a idea that we could see moons orbiting Jupiter. Now, let me say, this is a real movie. It is not a computer simulation, okay? Juno is approaching Jupiter, the sun is to the right, Photons leave the sun, 40 minutes later, they bounce off Jupiter's clouds and come into the camera of Juno as it approaches Jupiter. And we see these four moons, Eo, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. And indeed, um, this first glimpse, the first time we've ever made this movie, no one has made this movie before. From the earth, you have a very, Spur, um, occasional glimpses of the moons. Here we get to see the whole thing moving around. And indeed, Eo, Europa and uh, Ganymede are in resonant orbits where they orbit around Jupiter in a one to two to four pattern. 
Okay, so Juno was able to see this for the first time on approach and is uh, a really impressive movie uh, to see and makes you really appreciate um, what Galileo deduced from just looking a few nights at the moon system. So uh, Juno went into orbit uh, in, in 2016 and has since made um, 32 passes. We call those perijoves um, in close uh, of, of the last one, most recent one being um, uh, about 10 days ago in the end of February. Now, what we really want to understand is what it's like inside, because if we can understand what it's like inside Jupiter, then that gives us a sense of, of the models of how the solar system formed. It constrains our ideas, our theories of how the solar system formed. So this is a cross section for Jupiter. Remember it's 318 times the mass of the Earth. So it's a really big, massive object. And um, when we look at the scale on the right, it has density. And um, if you, uh, very low density, high up, very gassy atmosphere, and then it increases, it goes down. And one density of one grams per cubic centimeter is water, okay? Very conveniently. You go a bit deeper, it says four there, and that's sort of the density of rock. And then you get deeper again, and it's more like the density of, of the heaviest metals on earth. Now, on the left-hand side of this, we have a scale of temperature, fairly cool near the top, and then going down to about four times the temperature of the surface of the sun in close. So very high temperature deep down inside. And then further to the left, we have pressure. Now, um, let me just say, I'll talk a bit about pressure in a second. What we start off with hydrogen, it starts as a gas at the top. If you compress it higher the pressure as you go down, then it turns into a liquid. And then you really compress it a lot. And the pressures on the left are in atmosphere pressures, if you like. So one bar is one atmospheric pressure. It's the, the pressure of the atmosphere that we're breathing. Two million bars, two million atmospheric pressures is where hydrogen begins to become metallic. And so that means that the electrons and the protons can move relative to each other and you can drive electrical currents. And that's where the magnetic dynamo is that produces the very strong magnetic field inside Jupiter. So let's think a little bit about these pressures on the left. What, what do they mean? You know, how do you get a feel for this? Well, let me give you a sense. If you work out what the pressure at the center of Jupiter is, it's sort of equivalent to, you can do a back of envelope calculation, a thousand elephants standing on top of each other with the bottom elephant standing on one leg on a stiletto heel. So think of all of that mass. This is in Earth's gravity. And you um, put all of that mass into the tiny area of a stiletto heel. And that is equivalent to the pressure at the center of Jupiter. So there's very high pressures at what is compressing the hydrogen and turning it into liquid metallic hydrogen. So we want to measure the gravity of Jupiter to get a sense of what it's like inside. So what we do, the spacecraft, which is this orbiting, this blue line here, sends signals back to the Earth, radio signals, and we measure the frequency of that radio signal. And as the spacecraft's orbit changes, wiggles back and forth due to the gravity, the distribution of mass inside. We'll go through this animation again. If it was a uniform gravity and a uniform mass inside, it would be a very simple curve and there'd be no big Doppler shift, no shift in the radio frequency. But if it's a wiggling path due to perturbed by the mass inside Jupiter, then we measure a Doppler shift of the radio signal coming back to the Earth. OK, and that measures the speed, just as the police, the cops measure your speed um, using radar. Um, bouncing off your car. Same sort of technique. So what we found by measuring gravity with Juno, 
using this Doppler shift technique is that in fact, the mass inside is not the simple picture that we first drew, but is in fact mixed up. It's a little messier. The heavier elements at the center it, are not in a very limited condensed core, but more spread out and mixed in. And there seems to be that the hydrogen is separating out, the helium is separating out from the hydrogen, and there's much um, fuzzier inside. So this is the sort of picture that we've been getting. There have been alternative pictures. This is another one that says there are different layers convecting in different ways. Um, we're starting to put this picture together and there's a big debate on the team. Exactly what is it like inside um, uh, the center of Jupiter? So we also measure the magnetic field, not just gravity, but also the magnetic field. And that tells us about the dynamo inside. What's the structure of the magnetic field inside? And so when we map out the magnetic field, and here the color here gives you a sense of strength of the magnetic field, what we see is that it's very asymmetric between the north and the south, much stronger in the north, weaker in the south, and seems to be sort of erratic patterning. And uh, we make a model of this. You can see the magnetic field lines shown sort of like a, 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 a a bar magnet and, and you can see the iron filings being changed. So this is the same sort of structure, but you can see that there's some strong regions in the north, weaker in the south, and there's an anomaly, this blue area that's coming around is a weak field area. And this is much like the South Atlantic anomaly that we have on the earth, where there's a very weak field region right over Buenos Aires in um, uh, South America. So the field isn't a simple bar magnet, it's more complicated. And um, why and how that works is what we're really working on trying to understand. Now above those layers, um, we want to look for the water and we want to see the winds and we want to see the different layers of clouds higher up. So how do we measure the water? So if you look at these clouds, ammonia at the top, ammonia hydrosulfide, and then water deeper down, they're hard to see with visible light because we just see the upper cloud layer. If we use infrared light at longer wavelengths, this image on the right that was taken with a um, infrared telescope in Hawaii, what you see is that you can see the hot layers deeper down are bright and the cooler upper layers are dark. And so with infrared, you can get down sort of through the ammonia layer and begin to see deeper down inside the planet using this longer wavelength than visible light. To get even further down into the water, we need to use microwaves, so longer wavelengths. And so Juno carries a microwave instrument that looks at six different wavelengths uh, up to half a meter in wavelength. And that allows us to penetrate through deeper below the cloud layers. So here is just to give you a glimpse, the, the, the uh, view from Juno's infrared camera looking at the infrared part. And then when we look at the microwaves, we're beginning to map out uh, below the ammonia down into um, the, the deeper areas. And of course, what we thought was that underneath the top cloud layers, we would have a uniform um, spacing of clouds. And, uh, but in fact, when we look at um, these different flybys, looking at the mapping out, the equator is at the center and higher latitudes to the left and right, you can see that the distribution of material inside Jupiter is not uniform and it seems to be moving around. So this is a lot messier and more complicated than what we thought we were going to see. Not so simple as the simple textbook picture. Indeed, um, what we think this animation is showing that we have these outer belts and zones where the weather layer is and beneath this, we think there are convecting cells 
um, that are uh, indications of deep circulation. And maybe there's even deeper circulation below this. Um, we're trying to work out what the layer is underneath um, and, and further down inside. So we've started the deep interior working outwards. Um, now let's think about what we're looking at with visible light when we use a camera. And I'll mention that we just added on this little visible light camera to keep the public quiet, you know, just throw them some snaps. That's, that was snooty scientist attitude, right? Uh, but indeed, we've discovered that this has been a very interesting experiment, not just some fantastic science and beautiful imagery, but also a great uh, uh, involvement of the public uh, in the uh, mission because they can access, anybody can go to this website, I encourage you to do so. You can download the data as soon as they are um, sent from the spacecraft to the earth. And then you can play with the images, and do what you want with them and post them back up again and have discussions and get involved in image processing. So this has actually turned out to be a fantastic thing. Citizen science is fantastic. So first of all, let's show, let me show you the, some of these images. And the top left is a sort of what we think is a sort of true color, what your eyes would see if you went past Jupiter. And it would be rather subtle in coloring. To get a sense of the structure in the atmosphere, um, what the image processors are doing is to take the image and then crank up the color contrast in the way you do this, maybe on your TV or on your camera, you can change the color, make it stronger. And here are some examples of the amazing structure that you can see when you really crank up this contrast. So Juno is getting up close to Jupiter, really up close than any other spacecraft has been before with some, a, a good little camera, a high quality camera, it, albeit quite small, and is able to get these snapshots as it's moving very fast from pole to pole. And then very clever image processing by um, uh, a mixture of scientists and indeed artists. Look at what the artists are doing with these amazing pictures. So I think it's fantastic that this creativity has been unleashed and people are doing all sorts of fun things with these images, not just science, but art. So here are a few of the pictures and you can begin to see the turbulence in the atmosphere. This turbulence is driven by a combination of wind shears, very strong winds, but also heat from below stirring up things and driving the clouds up. Here is another beautiful example. There are uh, storms, both cyclones and anticyclones, high pressure and low pressure regions. And, and uh, just as we have at Earth, same sort of thing happening at Jupiter. And we're also seeing, which is a bit surprising, that some of these um, eddies have light areas at the center, dark on the outside. And other times it's dark on the inside and light on the outside and we're trying to work out why there are these differences. What is that telling us about the dynamics of these storms? Here's another example of a beautiful, more subtle, um, turbulent region uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, here is a, uh, an example further north and uh, near the equator, clouds tend to be more orangey. And this is telling us that there's more of this colorant uh, in the in the atmosphere. And we think this is produced by sunlight reacting with the chemicals in the atmosphere and making a little bit of this orangey color. But then as you move to the poles, um, what we're seeing is more similar to our, our blue skies where we have scattering of sunlight, blue part of sunlight preferentially making the sky look a little blue. And then on top of that, we have clouds that are convecting and um, showing these white clouds. Now, what's interesting here is this is fairly close to the um, day-night boundary, the terminator. You can see these white clouds that seem to be popping up 
and you can see shadows around them and we think these are sticking up. Here's another example, a really nice example of these what we call pop-up clouds, but they're really just like the um, clouds we see here on Earth. These are ammonia clouds, okay? But similar to the water clouds that we see, I took this picture out of a plane in the days when we flew around and um, you can get a sense of these water clouds being produced when moist hot air rises up, the uh, cools off, the water condenses, and you get these water clouds sort of popping up. And we see the same sort of thing at Jupiter, but with the ammonia ice clouds. So again, here's another example, a storm region with fresh um, clouds being produced. And then the older cloud regions are the ones that have accumulated some of this orangey material and so you could sort of almost say age um, gives you more color. You can get a sense of how long these things have been around. Here's another really beautiful uh, storm region with turbulent um, disturbances around it. This is one of my favorite. It, you know, people have been looking at the clouds and seeing things, right, since the beginning. And maybe you can see, this is one of my favorite, the owly eyes. Do you see the owly eyes up here? Isn't that cool? And um, then this is another one. Do you see Danny the dolphin? Let me zoom in and you can see Danny the dolphin, right? Isn't that cool? Maybe he's being chased by a dragon. Oh, and then here, don't you see a pelican? Maybe a pelican up here? The next orbit, Danny was gone, but these are fun things to see in the clouds. This is perhaps more typical, uh, a really interesting, this, clearly this, this very brown area has been around for a long time and accumulated a lot of the brown material that's the photochemical reactions um, with the gases that make the brown material. So here is an infrared movie, a really beautiful movie um, that the Italian Giram team put together. And uh, you can see the light, the dark areas are where it's cold, high clouds. The light areas, the bright areas are where it's hot and you're looking between the clouds. And um, you see the sort of bright edges around the some of the eddies. And then we're looking towards the South Pole and you can see here at the South Pole that there is a set of vortices around the very South Pole. And um, this is what we see at both the North and the South Poles. So in the South Pole, we see one, two, three, four, five vortices around a central vortex. Whereas the North Pole, we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And over the past four years, We've seen five in the south, eight in the north, persistently. Now, they do vary a little bit with time. And here we have a sequence of 15 different passes. And you can see in the south hemisphere, what you see here is sometimes you see a little vortex sort of trying to get in, trying to poke in. Uh, sometimes you see... Um, a vortex merging. So in the middle here, you can see a vortex merging over there on the left, another vortex merging. Other times they try to merge and then they get sort of spat out. And um, so we, we're not able to, because we just have single flyby and then go away for several weeks and come back again. We're not making uh, movies of continuous changes, but we can see that over the, f the uh, four years, we've seen quite a change. Same number, five for the south, eight for the north, but um, they're sort of jostling about and sometimes merging, sometimes um, being pushed around. So this is really teaching us a lot about these um, north polar regions that we had never seen before with spacecraft and giving us a sense of how this very dynamic atmosphere, uh, in some ways, uh, it's constantly moving around, but at the same time seems to be persistent um, behavior over years. So um, one of my favorite pictures here um, is, uh, was processed by um, British astronomer John Rogers, who's been observing Jupiter 
a variety of methods from the ground and uh, uh, from space, and he put this one together with the Juno images. Lovely uh, haze in the polar region, sort of like a lovely furry uh, scarf that you would like to put around in the winter. Okay, so we need to talk about the Great Red Spot. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture. Um, you can see beautiful uh, accuracy that you can see, not as much detail as you see with Juno, but, but pretty impressive. Um, and um, the Great Red Spot, of course, has been observed. Um, there's some question whether Galileo saw it, but, but it's been observed for hundreds, for centuries, hundreds of years. Um, so Voyager that flew past Jupiter in 1979, that's when I did my PhD thesis working on Voyager data. Um, at that time, the Great Red Spot seemed to be about twice the size of the Earth, and it circulated in about six days. Um, so there was this big, it's a high pressure region, and you can see this anti-clockwise um, motion and um, this is this is the storm that we observed with Voyager. What did Juno see? Well, depending on whether it was an artist or a scientist, this artist was a very um, fertile imagination. Um, a little more realistically, <laughs> this is a view that is showing you that at the time of Juno, the Great Red Spot has shrunk. It seems to have also got a little darker or redder maybe accumulating more of those uh, that red chemical that is 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 causing that color um photochemical reactions producing that red material uh, and then a very white area around and and turbulence on the side so there's been some really um beautiful images here of the red red spot this is perhaps more natural um than the previous one and you can see um, the downstream turbulence that is produced in the um, stream by uh, material having to divert around the Great Red Spot. Here is an animation sort of showing you the circulation and what it's like. Um, so this anti-clockwise um, uh, motion. So remember that this is um, one and a half times the size of the Earth. It's a really big storm. And it's actually really quite thin. Um, it's not, it, it's, it's deep relative to the rest of the gases, but it's thin relative to the size of the planet. So here is um, a nice combination of um, a Juno image at the top and a ground-based image uh, taken uh, in Australia, telescopic image. And then John Rogers, um, again, um, British astronomer who's been studying the weather systems at Jupiter for many years. He's written a big, fat, lovely book all about uh, observations of the weather on Jupiter. Uh, and here he's mapped out on this, this image um, the different belts and zones and, and the um, weather systems at Jupiter. So when we look at the Great Red Spot um, using the microwaves, we actually can look down through the structure and see that it penetrates quite deep. So a depth of, of something like 150 kilometers, which um, seems a, a, a very deep, that's um, not quite the height of the space station over the, over the, over the earth, but you know, it's, it's that distance would be, you'd be up in space at that sort of distance above the earth atmosphere. Um, but when you think about the size of Jupiter, this is just the thin skin around the outer edges. So when we look at the Great Red Spot, we can see that it's still shrinking. When we look from orbit to orbit, we've been making some more observations. And I'll just give a um, plug for a talk that I gave, a public talk that's now on YouTube. And it was uh, in January here at, at University of Colorado. I went back and looked at the history of the Great Red Spot and all the observations that people have made over time and uh, put, it, put it in context. So um, that was a lot of fun to put together and I encourage you, if you're interested, to go check it out. 
Here is uh, one of the most recent pictures of the Great Red Spot. And again, it's a really beautiful, very aesthetic cloud structures uh, around it. So here is um, just a beautiful composite uh, taken by this little Juno cam uh, camera. And isn't that amazing for an outreach camera? We, we've, we've done all this amazing uh, images, uh, beautiful as uh, opportunities for people to explore not just the science, but also uh, some art. So let's step away from Jupiter and look a little bit at the moons. Um, Juno has not been looking at the moons much, but we've been looking at the phenomena associated with the moons. So the innermost of the four Galilean moons, Eo, um, is we know from this uh, Galileo picture, the Galileo spacecraft took this, this uh, image of Eo, and you can see it's sort of orangey, orangey yellowy, and that's sulfur. And the white stuff is sulfur dioxide. So sulfur dioxide comes out of the plumes, condenses onto the surface, it has an atmosphere of sulfur dioxide, SO2. And uh, indeed, when the New Horizons spacecraft went on its way to Pluto, it took this movie of this huge venting um, volcano, this plume, Tvashtar, as it's called. And you can see not just SO2, but also sort of dust material coming out of this uh, volcano. So Eo is the most volcanic object in our solar system. It is covered with volcanoes. And so these, this infrared picture taken by a JRAM instrument on Juno, is uh, showing you these spots are lava, active volcanoes. It's hot lava spewing out onto the surface um, and spewing out sulfur dioxide. Now, on the left, you see Eo moving through the magnetic field sweeping past the moon. And um, a lot of material comes out of those uh, volcanoes and those vents. And uh, in fact, a ton a second of material is dumped out into this area. It becomes ionized and then becomes trapped in the magnetic field. And this sort of uh, red thing around here is the uh, plasma torus, that's charged particles, sulfur and oxygen ions with electrons that glow in the UV and uh, form this big donut of charged particles around Jupiter. Now there's also electrical currents that flow between the moon Eo and the planet Jupiter, uh, exciting aurora. And so uh, a ton a second of, of volcanic gases. So that's sort of like a pickup truck of, of material being dumped out of the moon into the space around it uh, every second. And then uh, a million amperes of current flowing from Eo to Jupiter and um, carrying electrons that excite the atmosphere and produce aurora. Now this magnetic field of Jupiter is very strong. It's um, the surface field is about 23 times that of, that of the Earth. It produces a volume, what we call a magnetosphere. Uh, and in fact, we could take all of the Earth's magnetosphere and put it within the planet Jupiter um, because indeed, um, the, the environment around Jupiter is ionized and the magnetic field dominates out into the solar wind uh, for a hundred times the radius of, of uh, Jupiter. So uh, this whole volume is coupled by the magnetic field of the planet, so it spins every 10 hours, and this ton a second fills the material, fills um, this magnetosphere with sulfur and oxygen ions that ultimately come from the volcanoes on Eo. Very bizarre, and this is what I've been studying for the past 40 years. But it wasn't until Juno that we got a glimpse of the poles. Now with Hubble, we can look at the aurora, uh, but it's very distant view, and we see the aurora. This is a UV emission. Um, we see the aurora um, that is associated with the moons, Eo, Europa and Ganymede. We can't see anything associated with Callisto because it's sort of mixed in with the main aurora over water. But here's a Hubble movie and you can see the aurora due to Eo over here 
in G2 at Ganymede over here. And you can see it's very dynamic. With Juno, we can look at both the UV emission and the infrared emission. And um, we see that magnetic anomaly in the north distorting the uh, shape of the aurora. And um, we see a lot of structure. We see um, uh, detailed uh, structure at the different wavelengths. And what we're learning by flying over and measuring the charged particles that are bombarding the atmosphere, we're getting a sense of what the energy is, what, they're in, what the energy is of the particles, how they might be accelerated, how they may interact with the atmosphere and produce this aurora. It's putting a lot of energy into the polar regions of Jupiter. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, summarize that the Juno is flying by, it's looking at the aurora, it's measuring charged particles, it's looking at the outer atmosphere, it's looking deeper into the atmosphere. We're seeing the magnetic field, the gravity field. It's telling us what the internal structure is like. And the bottom line is it doesn't look like the textbooks. It's not as simple as this. It's a lot messier inside. And with that, I will stop. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fran. And, uh, uh... We will have questions um, in the chat channel, please. But um, if you choose to unmute yourself, you can ask the question. But I won't be able to see you um, with so many participants. So uh, going to the chat channel, um, the first question is about um, the core of Jupiter. Um, Surely we should expect to see rocks and metals there here, uh, Jeffrey asks. Well, that's what, you know, the textbooks say, right? But it turns out that at these pressures, so think of a thousand elephants with the bottom elephant standing on a stiletto hill, a million, um, so 50 million times the pressure in Earth's atmosphere. We don't actually know how hydrogen works at those pressures. We, it's not something that we can actually do in the lab. Uh, but the current thinking is that the elements, the heavy elements, so iron, calcium, as well as the oxygen, the carbon, the nitrogen, and so on, stuff that make up silicon, make up rocks and metals. Um, in fact, those atoms are probably dissolved in the uh, hydrogen, metallic hydrogen. And so there's some mixing of those uh, elements, heavy elements, with the hydrogen. And that's what's making this diffuse core. It's not that single sort of rock layer and then a gas layer. It's much more mixed up. Yeah. Okay, but for the next one, then, uh, Trish Fosbury. Uh, I wonder if you'd like to unmute yourself and make yourself visible. Uh, I should have asked Jeff to do the same thing, but um, um, perhaps you could put your question directly. Yes, I, I was interested in the um, comparison with the South Atlantic anomaly, which, of course, Hubble has to fly through fairly frequently, and we know it very well. Um, do we know about the time scale of the variations of the surface, I call it surface magnet, the magnetic field right. pattern on Jupiter. Do, do we actually see any variations of that? Well, um, we've, we've, unfortunately, we only have the flybys of um, Pioneer and Voyager that got fairly close. Galileo did not get very close. Um, and so the measurements that we have of the magnetic field were rather limited earlier on over the past 40 years. And so um, there has been a study by Kimmy Moore, who did a PhD on this topic in, in Harvard, looking at can we detect the time variation of the field um, com by comparing those early flybys to the Juno data. And there's some suggestion that, yes, there could be a variation with time. But, you know, with Earth, we... we we measure by having spacecraft where we've been measuring them since people went around with, with measuring 
um, with, with simple compasses, right, in the in the days of early navigation. But um, we, the time scales are, uh, even for the Earth, are not uh, short. It's more decades than it is years. So it's a little hard to measure with Jupiter. Now, we have just heard that Juno will be extended for another five years. And so there's a good chance we will have another, um, I think it's another 40 orbits, we should be able to measure the high details of that weak region and the anomaly. And that will tell us the time variation, the secular variation. And of course, that's very important for understanding how the dynamo works. And so a lot of people are very keen to see that. Hmm. So yes, the Thank anomalies you. are always exciting. Thank you. And uh, while we're with you, Bob, we, you were asking if there's any ozone in the atmosphere. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, you, not, you say there's not much oxygen, but this is, uh, can you actually measure ozone? Presumably that's easy. Well, um, um, no, there isn't ozone. And um, the reason is that it would react with the uh, ammonia. Uh, and so the, 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 the oxygen is as water and it's deeper down right so there's no free oxygen in the in the atmosphere yeah so do you know the blue is scattering blue it's just really scattering blue is it that's my understanding is it's really scattering so you just need to have a molecule that scatters the scatters the atmosphere yeah thank you Scatters the sunlight sorry the blue preferential scattering of blue sunlight yeah thank you Right, Roger Moses, would you like to unmute yourself and make yourself visible? Right. I'm in the dark, unfortunately. <laughs> um, there's a huge amount of vorticity here. And on the Earth, it's often triggered by topographic features underneath or features, thermal features in the ocean. There's none of that here, high up. What on Earth is doing it all? Um, OK, so yes, huge amount of autisticity. You're absolutely right. And um, you have to remember that with, yes, there's no continents underneath um, uh, and to disrupt things. There's very strong wind shears. You have these multiple belts and zones and then you have a lot of wind shears. And, and so you have vorticity associated with the interactions between these wind shears. Um, there's also, although there's no ocean to speak of, we are now learning um, that it isn't just a simple single weather layer with a static underlying region. It's clear that there's probably a separate convection system, slower, larger, deeper down. And there is some coupling to the upper layer. The heat is coming from below. Jupiter emits in infrared two and a half times the energy that it gets from the sun, okay? So this is internally driven convection that is driving the uh, weather system. And along with that, and remember it's spinning also every 10 hours. So it's 10 times the size of the earth and it's spinning faster. So there's a lot of vorticity associated, ang it's uh, angular momentum associated with that spinning. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Chris Pullen, um, would you like to ask your question, make yourself visible? Well, Chris is asking, how much has EO shrunk over four and a half billion years? Oh, actually, it turns out not very much. You'd think, right, you'd think if you're spewing out a ton a second. Hmm. And I have done the calculation, I've forgotten the exact number, but I think it's something like four kilometres or something, so it's nothing. Yeah, I know. And uh, Jeff Wilson, would you like to make yourself visible and ask your question? It's related to the one before, but I th it's slightly different. 
I mean about about the source of the heat. Ask you a question. What's yes, question? thank you. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you very much for the. Uh, and my my head's still spinning with all the information that that you gave. But yeah, my my question was really, um, what is the source of the heat? Is it you know in in Earth it's thought to be radioactive decay? Do you think it's the same on Jupiter? The source of the heat of the planet Jupiter or of Eo, they're different. Uh, the, the, the source of the planet Jupiter, you said that the, the heat. internal yes. right. temperature goes to tens of, th was it tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of degrees? Uh, 20,000, yeah. So, um, so think of 318 times the mass of the Earth, right? That's a lot of material to come together, okay? And so when you make a planet, you've got some stuff there that pulls in passing pieces that come in and bombard and join in with the planet. And, and that what you're doing is you're taking kinetic energy of the material coming in, falling into the planet and converting it into, into thermal energy inside. So, but you're making 318 times the mass of the Earth. So that's a lot of, lot of material coming in. And so you heat up this initial planet, the way all the planets get really hot at the beginning. Now, the key is this. Think of Jupiter as a big fat baked potato and the Earth as a pea. And, you know, the peas cool off really quickly because the surface area to volume is, is really high. You look at a big potato, it takes a long time to cool off because the surface area is small compared with the volume. Mm -hmm. Same is true with planets, right? So Jupiter is a big fat, big potato and the earth is a little pea. So um, it's not that you need radioactivity. In fact, radioactivity is probably tiny at Jupiter. Um, it's the potential energy that's pulling material in and then it gets stored as heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. good question. Hey, uh, Charles Draper, you wanted to ask about the magnetic field. Yes, great talk, Fran. Thank you. It's fantastic. Um, one of the other things you said was that the, 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 the basic magnetic field is not a simple dipole. It's a big the differentiation between north and south. Um, and yet Jupiter, um, it's, it, it's always, as I, as I understand it, it's, um, it's, its angular tilt isn't very great. There isn't an obvious huge uh, superficial difference between north and south. So what are the plausible explana explanations for this, 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 this asymmetric uh, field. You know, I would like to pull up um, a diagram. Can I do that? Can I just share my screen again? Would I be allowed to do that? Uh, Let me try, because yes. what I want to do... Oh, yes, we have it. Okay, hang on a minute. Let me just... Um, ooh. Okay, forget it. I'm not going to be able to make it work. Never mind. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Let me just explain. So you've got a big area where the magnetic field is generated. In the middle, you have this core. And if it's a tiny little core, then it doesn't really get in the way of the dynamo. But if you now have a diffuse core that's more spread out, it can interfere with the dynamo. And so they're the north part of the dynamo and the south part of the dynamo may not be able to talk to each other, communicate by fluids, right? And so you can imagine then, because you've got a, a it, it, you tend to have, um, uh, because it's spinning a lot, you tend to have flows which go around. And so the top and the bottom aren't, necessarily communicating and you have an up and upper and lower dynamo north and south dynamo that could be rather different the flows could be a little different and so you can end up with um, a north south asymmetry um, but we don't know yet dynamo but, theory isn't isn't hasn't got there yet but the, 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 do the poles flip the way they do um, on the earth who knows? We've only been, we haven't been observing long enough, right? right. So the Earth's 
um, the sun flips every 10 years, nice, fairly regular, 10 to 10 and a half years. The Earth's, it's irregular every 20,000, 200,000 years, something like that. I mean, it, it's a long time. So what's happening with Jupiter? It's probably somewhere in between, but we have no clue. We've only been observing the magnetic field since the 60s using radio observations. So who knows? Thank you. Would the person who identifies as iPad like to put their question or do you want me to uh, put it for you? Uh, well, yes, please. So uh, what, uh, go ahead then, Dupali. Oh, um, sorry, yeah, my question really was that um, you, sh <coughs> sorry, you showed us the diagram of the um, huge mantle of Jupiter, which is um, a solidified magnetic um, uh, hydrogen. Uh, so no, it's not solid, it's liquid. Liquid, it needs to be liquid to have a dynamo. Liquid metallic hydrogen. Oh, I see. So, yeah. but why is, is um, the planet known as a gas planet? Because it's not all gas. Right, it's gas on the outside and most of it is gas on the outside. So it's fluid deeper in. When you compress a gas, it becomes a fluid. Um, right. But it's really in contrast to the Earth and to Mars and to Venus and to Mercury, which are rocky planets. So it's really the contrast. You could, you, okay, so you could call it a fluid if you like. <laughs> yeah. uh, I also have a question based on uh, Charles's earlier question about the disparities between the North and South Poles. Right. Uh, you said there was lack of communication, a uh, fluid communication between the poles for, you know, because of the way yeah. uh, the structure of the planet. However, you did say that it's been consistently the same. The North Pole has been heavier than the South Pole consistently since observations uh, began. Uh, what's the explanation for that? Well, we don't know. I mean, um, the thing is that with, with Jupiter, the day-to-day, the hour-to-hour weather, if you like, so the turbulence is um, it's highly varying, right? But the but the um, the climate or the the atmospheric general behavior, the circulation is much more stable. So we've seen these belts and zones; they don't vary very much from year to year. The Great Red Spot has been there for for centuries, and these vortices around the poles, although there seems to be some jostling about, you have a stability in terms of the general circulation in the north and in the south um, that produces, okay, eight vortices at one and, and five at the other, but, but it's been that way for five years. And, you know, whereas the earth, you can think very little stays stable for five years of the earth's weather, right? So it's sort of an interesting different time scales for the different um, phenomena, Jupiter than the earth. Thank you. Right, I'm going through some of the comments. So some people have uh, said what a great talk it is and other nice things like that. But um, the, so I'm coming to the next question. Uh, this is uh, Simon Ould. Would you like to make yourself visible and ask the question? Hello, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. Um, I run a mobile planetarium, uh, which I normally take around to schools, and children are fascinated, of course, about the possibility of alien life. Now, um, as you're uh, very much an expert on the uh, Jovian magnetic fields, uh, I was wondering if you think that the strength of the uh, magnetosphere and the mag magnetic field of Jupiter would eliminate any possibility of life in Europa's oceans. Oh, no, I, I mean, Europa, Euro, Europa's oceans. So underneath the ice layer, there's a substantial amount of water. We know it's there and we know it's liquid because of the perturbation to the magnetic field that's observed by the Galileo spacecraft when it flew by. And that told us that there had to be electrical currents that are induced inside uh, this ocean, just as our ocean experiences 
electrical currents that are induced in them. Um, but at, at, uh, at Europa, this was key for telling us that it was liquid and it's conducting, which means it has salts dissolved in it. And so indeed, in my opinion, it is the most likely place in our solar system to find life if there is any life in our solar system outside the Earth. And so um, the idea is to go and see if we can measure um, the heat flow and find a place where that ice is thinnest. And if, if there's anywhere where the water is coming from the ocean out, so we might be able to see if what the chemistry is and if there's any biochemistry and any astrobiology, that would be the place to go. Yeah, Brilliant. no question. But the magnetic field the, the, is not really the problem. Indeed, there is the, that charged particles, the plasma that interacts with, with Europa means the surface can be bombarded with energetic particles, which doesn't make it very safe for life. But underneath in the ocean, it would be lovely. <laughs> Warm, wet, lots of nutrients. It's pitch dark. Wiggling about <laughs> whales. Yeah, wonderful. And if you'll just indulge me uh, with one quick further thought that comes to me, uh, which I know children have asked me in the past, um, about the red spot. You see, you've been able to see with the um, Juno observations um, that it's continuing to shrink. I've often asked, is it going to disappear? Nia? We don't know. We don't know. It comes and goes over the centuries. Uh, and I do urge you to go look at my talk um, on YouTube. Um, we don't know. It, it could well shrink and then get bigger again. It may break up. Mm. I can say all years. the more reason for them to become the next generation of exactly. uh, Jovian uh, scientists. Yes. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Yes, can, can I ask you to email us that link so that we can put it on the uh, Herschel Society website and then people right. can find it? If, if you Google Fran Bagnall and Great Red Spot, it'll come up. Oh, OK, great. Now, um, Bas for Planken uh, um, has asked a question about um, travelling in that area. Would you like to make yourself visible and ask the question yourself? Yes, hello. Yes, I wonder, um, is there, is there any, any chance that, apart from the technical uh, difficulties to get there, is there any chance that humans could, could actually be there and explore uh, Jupiter um, from a bit more, you know? I, I, suppose, well, you, I suppose you want, you would love to be there, isn't it? No, no, there's, there's nothing that humans can do in space other uh, uh, that robots can't do more efficiently mm. more effectively much cheaper uh than tourism mm. and i don't think there's any point in doing tourism to be honest and certainly shouldn't be paid for by the taxpayer mm. so i'm sorry to be such a dampener i mean i did grow up with apollo and i watched the guys on the moon but nowadays our robots are so much better why send these heavy meat bags into space when we can send a lightweight robot that can do all the things we want? I think what we need to do is to put robots all over the solar system and have them uh, turn them into virtual reality so that every kid has a pair of gloves mm -hmm. that allows them to manipulate the images and go all over the solar system and find out what's going on. I, we could do so much more that way than sending the odd human. Yeah, Sorry. It, it, it's a great message. And I think we, we've all been thrilled by all the robots so far. And so, so yes, I, I, I yeah. can see what you, mean, what you mean. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. So if I could ask um, you one final question. Um, you mentioned this um, huge current that flows from Io to Jupiter. And um, of course, a, um, a current should be a circuit and um, so presumably somehow it's got to come back again. I'm wondering how that works. Yes, so back in the 60s they thought it was a current that carried a bit like a wire. So you've got a, a conductor which is EO moving relative to the magnetic field, the magnetic field sweeps over it and so you have an induced uh, um, electrical ele electric field that drives a current along the field lines towards the planet and we thought back at the time before Voyager 
that it was like a current loop that went closed loop. We now found from Voyager that actually um, the density of plasma is too high and that you can't get the information to Jupiter and back. It travels via alphane waves. These are plasma waves, MHD waves. But the point is you can't get to Jupiter and back by the time that field line has moved past EO. And so you end up generating a wave, set of waves that are carried downstream from EO, going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And every time those waves reach the atmosphere of Jupiter, you produce aurora. And we see that auroral path stretching sort of three quarters of the way around Jupiter. It's amazing. So there isn't just a single electrical current it's a wave of of disturbances that propagate all the way around it's really very dramatic and it generates radio emission which you can see amateur astronomers have seen from the earth and and professional astronomers too um for for many decades so it's really interesting phenomenon well thank you this has been a, a really great talk because not only have we gone into um the complexity of jupiter and how we can peer into the structure more and more with infrared and microwaves and, and examine the magnetic fields and so on. But also we've seen the incredible beauty of the images which have come from Jupiter. So um, if everyone would like to unmute themselves and, and give uh, Fran a round of applause, she really deserves it. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I wish you a fabulous weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.